Stanford University. My name is Joyce Kiefer, and I'm with the Stanford Historical Society Oral History Project. Today is May 20th, 2016. I'm here with Ann Kermidjian, a professor of civil and environmental engineering. Ann's specialty is structural engineering with a particular emphasis on the effects of earthquakes. So I'd like to begin with asking her to begin her story with when she was young and growing up. Oh, thank you, Joyce. It's a pleasure for me to be here today. Um, my history is quite long at this point of my life, of course, and I've had many, many exciting experiences. Uh, looking back, I couldn't have imagined uh, that my life would um, take some of the turns and twists that have taken place over the years. I, as, as I told you before, I was born in Bulgaria. Um, Bulgaria at the time was during the peak of communism. And um, it was in 1965 that my family uh, decided to immigrate and come to the United States. But that, uh, that trip, that, that exodus was uh, quite exciting, um, very unusual, and had its own um, different turns and twists. We left Bulgaria, um, the entire family, five five members of our family, my brother, my mother, my father, and my grandmother, um, because we had uh, declared that we're going potentially to the United States, um, they took our passports away and they gave us $20 per person to come to leave the country. Um, my, I, I look back and I really admire my parents for being so brave to take the entire family and having confidence that they will be able to succeed um, living in Bulgaria and moving to a place where they had no idea what to expect. Um, the trip itself was uh, very eventful. We boarded a ship in uh, Varna, the, one of the main ports on the Black Sea of Bulgaria. Um, and the name of the ship, ironically enough, was Armenia. Um, I felt to say that the only reason why we could leave Bulgaria was because my father is, was Armenian and there was a short period of time when um, all the communist bloc countries were allowing minorities um, to leave and go to a, a place of their choice. Had we been purely Bulgarian, which my mother was, but because she was married to an Armenian, they allowed us to, allowed her to come along. Had we been Bulgarian, we could have never left legally. Um, so to make the long story short, um, we took a ship called Armenia and traveled through the Bosphorus and through Athens, and the ship stopped along the way in many places. And uh, um, I still remember the morning uh, the day after we left, um, we, I got up very early in the morning and we were passing through the Bosphorus. We didn't stop in Istanbul, but it, we, I did see the beautiful skyline of Istanbul and it was very, very inspiring to me. Um, it was one of my first experiences outside of Bulgaria uh, where I witnessed some of the architectural and civil engineering achievements uh, around the world with the minarets of Hagia Sophia. And I'd had early interest in architecture because my best friend's parents, both husband and wife, were architects. Um, and going through the Bosphorus sort of brought my very first reality to what some of the architectural achievements are, can be or have been over the years. My next stop was our the next stop of the ship was in Athens and uh, the Greeks were very sympathetic and even though we didn't have a passport they allowed us to come out uh, come off the ship and uh, visit Athens and this was my first trip to the Acropolis again another phenomenal architectural achievement um, and civil engineering structural engineering achievement that um, 
made a very um, strong impression on me and left um, just in increased my interest in, in architecture and engineering and then we stopped in Egypt but we were not allowed to get off we stopped in Cyprus and I we visited the um, the tomb of Othello, uh, Othello and Desdemona um, I'm probably mispronouncing them and I'm still probably using the pronunciation with it I grew up with <laughs> uh, but that's quite all right and I think it makes it more authentic but um, uh, so it was again, I grew up with opera, so Otello had a specific meaning to me. My mother sang beautifully, and my, I my, went to the opera when I was only 11 for the first time. So I, I knew the story of Otello and Desdemona. Uh, so it, it, made, I, I, it was very impressive for me. I was so pleased to have been able to visit it, uh, Nicosia and, and, and um, the um, burial place of Otello and Desdemona. And then we went through through Latakia, Syria, and our destination was Beirut, Lebanon. Now you were going to ask why Beirut, Lebanon, if you wanted to come to the United States. Well, um, we the, the, the Bulgarians would have never allowed us to, to come directly to the United States. And also, we would have had to wait for a visa. The, the visa process was very extensive. And we, as soon as we were told that we could leave Bulgaria, we took the first opportunity to leave. We didn't want to wait another three, four, or five months to get a visa for the United States because it took that long. Actually, it took longer uh, when once we were in Beirut to get a visa to the United States. Um, the vetting process was very thorough, uh, especially for someone coming from a communist country. Mm -hmm. You may remember the Cold War era, and this was at the peak of the Cold War era. 1965 was... Um, times were very contentious between the United States and the Soviet bloc countries. Um, Beirut was um, a very interesting experience. It was in total contrast to what Bulgaria was like. Um, um, Bulgaria was a very homogeneous society and Beirut was a conglomerate of a lot of different cultures and um, a lot of Armenians. The Armenian church was very influential at the time and they were the ones who were helping um, all the immigrants coming from Bulgaria and Romania and Poland and Czech Republic and where else, wherever else they may be coming. And, um, they helped my parents get a job right away and uh, uh, had arranged for an apartment for us uh, in Beirut and we spent seven and a half months in Beirut. Um, it, it was um, a very eye-opening experience. Um, I, I have to say that <laughs> um, as a young woman, as a, as a teenager, in, uh, at the time, not as predominantly Muslim country, but nevertheless, there were parts in, in the city that were predominantly Muslim. I, it was an interesting experience where you could sense the, um, the way women were treated, and you could see how women were treated. And, um, we, of course, kept mostly to the Armenian society, um, and, and, and I tried to take some English classes, but I have to admit I was quite lazy. <laughs> so you were 16 at the time? I was 16. Uh, I was 15. I actually turned 16 when, while we were there. Mm -hmm. We arrived in April and left in October, uh, end of, no, I'm sorry, left in November, end of November. Um, so I turned 16 in Beirut. Uh, in August. Um, so my arrival to the United States um, was right after Thanksgiving and everybody informed us as to uh, we had just missed one of the biggest celebrations of the Turkey Day. That's what my friends called it, the Turkey Day. Uh -huh. <laughs> it was later on that I found out the meaning of Thanksgiving and why it was celebrated. But it, when we first arrived, we were told we just missed a Turkey Day. And had you eaten turkey before? Um, not really. Not that I can remember. It, turkey was not considered to be a particularly delicious food or um, poultry. Mm -hmm. We ate a lot of chicken, but not, not turkey. Um, coming to the United States, was, I remember the very first morning um, after arriving, and this was in New York City. My brother and I walked out, and I was overwhelmed by the skyscrapers. 
Mm. And that was my very third experience with architecture and uh, structural engineering and civil engineering achievements. And we walked around and I'd never seen such tall buildings. I'd never seen so many buildings. <laughs> um, none of us spoke any English, the whole family. Um, our English was limited to hello, how are you, goodbye, good morning, good evening. That was the extent of all of our English. And, uh, um, we settled in, uh, in an apartment in Queens, again, through the Armenian church organization called Ancha. Uh, they were extremely helpful um, all the way, and both in Beirut and, and when we arrived in New York. Um, we settled in, in Forest Hills, New York, and um, the day after, I, one of the um, local Armenian ladies who lived in Forest Hills took me to Forest Hills High, High School to register. Now, in Bulgaria, I had been in, I had just started high, uh, high school. I was in ninth grade and finished the first semester of ninth grade, and the high school that I went to um, emphasized math and physics. You know, this was, those were the main um, math and sciences, I should say, but I was in a math and physics curriculum uh, in high school. And so I did, when I got to uh, Forest Hills High, well, the first thing that happened, my name got changed. <laughs> uh, from my, from uh, my, my uh, uh, baptismal name is Aravni, which is spelled A-G-H-A-V-N-Y, and mispronounced even in Bulgaria because it was so unusual and difficult. My, the, when I went to Bulgarian schools, they, they didn't know how to pronounce that, and, and all my teachers kept mispronouncing it. So is this um, an Armenian name? It is a purely Armenian okay. name. Um, and when I went to register, the lady asked me, what is your name? And I said, Aravni Setian. And she says, how do you spell that? And I said, A-G-H-A-V-N-Y. And she looked at me and she said, what do your friends call you? I said, Ani, ah, from here on, you're Anne. So now I've been Anne since then. <laughs> and I have to say, it's served me well. And I should thank that lady because I think the, the other women that I know with name Aravni have had considerable difficulty uh, with having it pronounced and spelled and my last name currently uh, is difficult enough. <laughs> I don't need two names that are really difficult so I'm glad for the easier and version of my name. But more interestingly um, I was enrolled in ninth grade math um, which was algebra at the time and I think about two and a half, two weeks, two and a half weeks. I can't remember exactly how long it was, but it was by middle of December. I was expected to take the math regents exam in algebra. Uh, I didn't speak any English, but algebra, you don't really need English. And I scored 98 on the math regents exam. And, and what is the regency exam? Um, it's administered in, New it's, it's part of the New York State educational system. Um, at the end of every um, semester or year, um, you take the exam to show academic proficiency in a particular subject. So in algebra, you take the algebra regents exam. In uh, physics, you take the physics uh, regents exam. And I will come back to the regents exam a little later because I did fail one. <laughs> So and you'll tell us which one you failed. Right, okay. I will, I will, because it's actually was pivotal in a lot of the things that happened afterwards. Um, so the, the following semester I was placed in um, geometry, but I had already taken all the geometry that I was be being covered, and I went to to um, the chair of the math department with my broken English. I tried to explain to her that uh, um, I'd already had that mat, and she looked at me and said, "Really? You're what? You were what in ninth grade?" And I said, "Yes." So she gave me a piece of paper with two problems to solve, and I, I knew the answer because I. I'd had similar problems on tests <laughs> back in Bulgaria. Um, I solved them 
rather quickly and gave them back to her and I still remember the expression of surprise on her face. And then I was placed in advanced pre-calculus class. Um, my ex experience with the physics was similar in chemistry, but I had real difficulty with English. I remember <coughs> reading Macbeth with uh, a dictionary until the wee hours of the morning and still not understanding very much. And um, <coughs> that was, I, I, and then we read, I can't remember which um, short story it was, but the, um, <laughs> my, my report must have been pretty horrific because the teacher came in and said, who wrote this piece of garbage? <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> I had to explain to him afterwards that it was me and I didn't speak English and English was a uh, second language for me and I was just learning and he felt very apologetic but um, I had a second experience like that later on in college. And, but it, English was a struggle. Um, I could speak broken English in about three and a half, four months after. Uh, after we had arrived, but it, it, it was uh, one of my main challenges is learning English. Um, they didn't have a English as a second language program? Oh, no. Program. Uh -huh. oh, no. I was one of four foreign students in, at the mm -hmm. time in the entire school. Of, I can't remember how many, but uh, there was no such thing as English for foreign students. Or uh, There were evening classes that my parents tried to take, and I tried to attend some of those. Um, but there were no special classes within the school. We, that does not exist. But I have to say, <coughs> um, I knew I had to learn English, and I did make a tremendous effort to learn as much as I can, as quickly as I can. Even with all my efforts, um, the very last semester of high school, I, I had to take history, American history regents exam. And again, American history for me was a totally new subject because mm -hmm. they didn't teach American history in Bulgaria because it was that capitalistic, imperialistic country that should not have existed altogether as far as they were concerned. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, yes, I had to take, I did okay on the history, uh, American history regents exam, I passed that, but I did fail the English regents exam. And as a result, I could not get an academic diploma because it was required to, have, to pass the regents exam to receive an academic high school diploma. So instead I was given a general high school diploma that is not worth, for any, worth anything. Um, so that semester, I, not only I failed the English Regents exam, but I had applied to several colleges because I was determined to go to college. And I knew I wanted to be an engineer. In fact, in my um, high school yearbook, under my picture, it says civil engineer surprisingly enough. Um, I guess early on I, I realized that I cannot be an architect because my artistic ability is freehand drawing is not great. But I was always very good in math and physics and civil engineering was the next thing to, to being an architect. Um, so I, I guess early on I decided that I was going to be a civil engineer. So that's what it says in my yearbook. Um, where was I going with that? Yes, yeah, so that, that uh, semester I uh, applied to several schools, including City College and Queens College of New York, and it's part of the City College system, and CW Post, and I don't can remember how many colleges I applied to, and I should say I, my parents couldn't help me with the applications. I'm, I'm amazed what parents do today to help their kids with applying to colleges. I, I didn't have anybody to tell me how to fill out an application. What should I be emphasizing? Um, I did all, I had to figure all that out on my own. No counselors in the high school? No. Um, um, oh, yeah. the, maybe they, they were helping. I just didn't know to ask. Okay. I didn't even know to ask. Mm -hmm. That's which you know I was thinking about. So I didn't. Perhaps there were, but I just didn't realize that I could ask for help. So I figured it all on my own. I had to figure it out all on my own. Well, not surprisingly enough, um, I got rejected by every single college that I'd applied to. So that. Um, 
spring, I got a general diploma instead of an academic diploma, and I didn't get, get accepted to any college that I was hoping to go to. Um, so what was I supposed to do? But I was determined. I knew I was going to go to college. I, whatever it took, I was going to go to college. And um, I took some typing classes for two, two weeks and took a job for the summer with a travel agency after I finished my very extensive typing. I'm still the worst typist in the world. <laughs> um, so I took a typing job with, uh, with this travel agency and I was working for this uh, lady that was a chain smoker and very neurotic. And, and she informed me that the only thing I'm supposed to do is answer the phone and pass it on to her. And I shouldn't discuss anything about travel arrangements with any of her clients. Well, she was busy on the phone with another client one day, and that one client wanted the information right there and then, and I gave her the information, and that was a major no-no. She fired me on the spot. And you knew, probably knew much more about travel than she did. Um, well, I don't know. I, I really don't know. I mean, I'd been there only for a few weeks, and so I... Um, a travel agents at the time did travel quite a bit, I believe. I, my recollection was that part of their perk was to, to get free travel to places. So she probably had traveled, but, but I had a little experience in travel. Yes, mm -hmm. you're, you're quite correct. Um, so I got fired. And then I searched for a job again and found a job at um, Kidder Peabody, one of the financial companies and on Wall Street at the time. I don't think they exist anymore. They've been probably got bought out during one of the downturns. But I was um, hired as a key punch operator, uh, which doesn't exist anymore either. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I worked as a key punch operator on this big machine, typing, punching cards and typing on cards, uh, all the information of all the trades from uh, the day before and that had to be entered and recorded. And um, I worked there for the rest of the summer and September came and I was ready to register for night school at Queens College and because um, I was going to go to night school for a couple of, for a semester or two and, t and then try to transfer during the day and that was my plan. Um, I went to my supervisor and asked if I, if I come half an hour early, can I leave half an hour early so that I can get from downtown New York, from Wall Street, New York, to Queens College, which was about, a, during rush hour, a good hour, uh, you know, maybe less, but still a good hour, uh, to get to the Queens College campus. So she turned around, she fired me. <laughs> I must have been, a, I have to admit, I must have been a pretty lousy typist. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I really don't know why she would fire me, but, but she did. Well, it looks like um, now you have no choice but to get into college. Um, well, but no college wanted me. Well, except for going to night school. and um, But that week I spent at home trying to figure out what I'm doing with my life. Um, it was um, time for me to go register for night school and I was just about to leave my house. You know, there are those moments in your life that you remember every second of it. Exactly. I remember that particular five or ten minutes of my life forever. Okay, and put can, us there. <laughs> right, so I'm, I'm ready to walk out of the house and the phone rings. And the phone was all the way in the kitchen. I was right by the front door. And I stopped and I said, oh, do I answer? Do I not answer? Oh, okay, let me go and answer. And I walked back and I picked up the phone. And it was Queen's College. And they said, oh, um, is this Anne Karamidjian? Uh, Anne Setian at the time, I'm sorry. Anne Setian, I'm so used to saying Anne Karamidjian. Anne Setian, and I said, yes. Um, I said, well, uh, we're calling from the admissions office, and um, we see that you have done extremely well in math and physics and chemistry, but you seem to have difficulties with English. Uh, are you a foreign student? Are you, have you been in a country very long? I said, no, I've been in the country for only a year and a half, and I didn't speak any English, um, so I've been learning English as much as I can. 
And so the lady on the other hand uh, and said, well, you've also declared pre-engineering. They didn't have an engineering program, so the, only, the idea was to go for three years at Queens and then transfer to, to, to another school. Um, so she said, well, um, we like your engineering, your, we like your math and physics um, background, and um, you're not, obviously not going to major in, in, in uh, English or history uh, or any of the humanities. If you promise, however, to take more English classes, you can, we have a spot for you as a regular student. I still get goosebumps when I say that. Oh, that's it was, wonderful. It was such a phenomenal moment in my life. I, I even brings tears to my eyes because it changed, turned my life around. Oh, that's wonderful. So I registered as a regular student uh -huh. and um, went on, went for three years at Queens College and I took every physics and math class that I possibly could take. Uh, in fact, I had so many classes in math and physics that the chair of the department, department of physics wanted to give me a physics degree before I transferred. And I said, no, I want to go into engineering. I, and, uh, and they were all wondering, why would I want to do that? I could get my degree right there at the end of the third year. I had more than enough units mm -hmm. and more than enough credits. But I was determined to go to an engineering school and become an engineer. I didn't want to be a physicist, um, and even though I did quite well. Um, so, at the end of the third year, I transferred to, I, I had the option to go to uh, City College of New York and NYU and Columbia, and I chose Columbia, and Columbia gave me a partial scholarship, and I did get another scholarship from a, a foundation called the um, Gilbankian Foundation, it supports Armenian students primarily. So. Um, I went to, to, to Columbia and finished my degree, my bachelor's degree in civil engineering there. Um, it was, I remember being at Queens College, being the only woman in my physics and math classes. I still remember walking in uh, the very first physics class. And up to that point, I hadn't realized that Women, it was not common for women to be engineers because I grew up with, as I told you, the, my best friend from growing up, her, her mother was an architect and I knew other women who were engineers in Bulgaria. So I didn't think I was doing anything unusual. I so would you say that in Bulgaria um, it was more common for women to um, study the sciences and math? Absolutely. And there was Absolutely. no stigma or was there? Um, I, if there was, I didn't see it. I did see a lot of women in math and science. And mm -hmm. in the high school that I went to, there were just as many young ladies as there were young men. And I don't think I ever heard anyone say, oh, you're a girl, you cannot do math or physics. I'd never heard that. And I hear that in the United States, even today, which is so sad. I never so, heard that growing up. That's amazing, and, and that growing up period was during the 50s and 60s. Correct. When it was even worse oh. in, um, in the U.S. anyway than mm -hmm. it is now. I mean, people are trying right, to hard. incorporate yes. uh, women and girls, but mm -hmm. not then at the time. Oh, at the time it was very unusual. I remember the high school counselor, when I told him that I'm going to be a civil engineer, he started laughing. <laughs> And oh, didn't dear. say more than that. He just laughed. He said, "You want to be a civil engineer?" Of course, I was that tiny little girl who barely weighed 105 pounds and had the pixie short haircut. Looked like a, I, even though I was 17, I probably looked more like 12. <laughs> I didn't. I wasn't wearing the makeup that all the other girls were wearing, and uh, looked more probably more innocent and, and immature than than anyone else. But I, my mind was made up. Yes, and, and when I went to, to, to Queens College, my very first physics class, there were 600 students in the first physics one. Um, and out of the 600 or so students, there were six, only six women. By the end of the semester, I was the only woman. There were a lot of also the young men who dropped out, but all the other women dropped out of the physics class. I was the only one. And I was the only one through all my physics classes, all of them. 
each and every one of them. Um, and when I got to Columbia, there were um, there had been another woman who had graduated before me, so they were they were quite quite open and supportive. I have to say that the faculty at Columbia were very very supportive. I had a very positive experience and. The faculty in physics and, and math, they were supportive in physics. I had some interesting experiences, but I was able to turn some of these professors around. Would you like to tell us about one of the experiences and how that <laughs> made a difference with the professor? <laughs> well, um, I was taking the nuclear physics class at, at Queens College, and again, I was the only female in the class, and I would always sit in the front row wearing my mini skirt. Um, I dare say, not realizing how ridiculous that must have been. <laughs> Looking back, I would say that's it's pretty very daring, but I was wearing a mini skirt and I would be sitting in the front row and uh, the teacher made a few derogatory remarks. It pertained to the open houses that um, Columbia and City College of New York and um, NYU was holding in two or three weeks, and NYU had invited the students to spend the night in the dormitory, and he was telling the students, the rest of the class, of male students, of course, that they can spend the night, and, and then turned to me and said, and you can spend the night with the boys. And I looked at him and just completely ignored him, and just didn't say a word, didn't say anything, just left class and just kept going to class and um, about a week or so later we had our midterm exam and um, I saw him coming sheepishly after he had graded the exam and said there's only one person in the class who scored 20 points above everybody else and that was me. Wonderful. And after that he wrote one of the nicest letters for me to go to Columbia. That's wonderful. So, but that has been my philosophy: is that I, I, I didn't start engineering because I was trying to change the world. I believed that I could be an engineer, and I just did my work. I did my job. I learned, and I tried to do what was expected of me. So, uh, if we could go back to Bulgaria a little bit, mm -hmm. um, I believe in another conversation you had said that math was taught differently, um, that there was a different attitude towards math and to conceptualizing math. Uh, could you explain that a little bit? Uh, that would make it different than what we learn in the U.S.? Mm -hmm. Well, I, my experience in learning math in the U.S. at the high school level relates primarily to my daughter taking math and not just high school, but junior high and elementary school. And if I compare the way we were taught math at elementary, junior, and high school level to the way math was taught in the school that my daughter went to, uh, it seems in a lot of schools in the US, math is taught by memorization. You memorize this, you memorize the answer. You mem the reason why I like math is because we were taught the concept. And you didn't have to read 30 books, you didn't have to memorize anything. You understood it and then you could solve the problem. Once you understand the concepts, then you could apply them. I, don't, I remember things until today that I've learned in elementary school, in high school, in college, and, and you know, even when I'm, even in class, even today, when I, I'm teaching and I introduce or, or, or ask the class fundamental concepts from calculus or from, from, from algebra, many of them don't remember them because they were never taught the principle behind it. They were taught to memorize it. They were given the answer instead of the process, instead of understanding the concept. If you understand con the concept, both math and physics and chemistry, you don't. Well, chemistry you have to go a little, a little more more memorization than in men, than physics and math. But to me, math has been beautiful because I can sit down, I can understand the concept. If somebody explains to me the concept, I can understand the concept, and then I can use it in a variety of ways. And that's, I think, the difference. And and if students are taught the concept rather than that 
told them, or if, if they're, rather than being told to memorize, um, beyond memorizing the, the multiplication tables, there's nothing really much to memorize in math. That's the only place I can see memorization useful. Mm -hmm. The rest of the math concepts are concepts to be understood, why certain things work the way they work. And once you understand that, it stays with you forever. So do you think that um, there's uh, like people's brains, uh, right brain, left brain, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, that predisposes somebody to understanding math more? Possibly. I mean, there, there, we are all different and we are, we do understand, we, we do approach problems in a different way. Um, I mean, my husband is a mathematician and, and he really gets into the concepts and, and he's yet at another level. And But when it comes to practical things, he doesn't think of certain things. So obviously we are all different and we all approach a pro uh, solving a problem in a different way. Um, and indeed, some people do wonderfully with literature and, and poetry and, and history, and, and I'm not the person. And so maybe I wasn't taught, taught that component the correct way. And, maybe, uh, and I, I don't really know. I, I've mm -hmm. never investigated it enough to be able to tell you that. But um, I, indeed, I think we, we, some people do approach math more easily understand the concepts more easily, but I do believe that um, early exposure and accepting math for what it is, rather than making it this mysterious uh, subject that, that is so difficult. I think math is being portrayed here as being so difficult that a lot of the students uh, are, are actually afraid to even try it. And, and, and the, the, as soon as they're confronted with it, if there is the first problem that they cannot solve, they feel that they're not gifted in that area. You don't have to be gifted to, 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 to try and, and solve a problem. And with some hand-holding hand uh, hand holding and, and, and um, if, if you, uh, how do I say this? It's, I, I really think that that the right pedagogical approach would be to allow the students to explore math and help them along the way step by step. For the students that grasp math much more quickly, they should certainly be challenged and moved forward. For the students who feel that this is a, a, a big obstacle, they have a block towards math, it is amazing to me uh, how if you work with them and show them simple problems, and, and there are a lot of people who have worked on this in the United States. I see um, colleagues in, in the math department and um, trying to approach mathematics and teaching particularly mathematics from different points of view. Um, and they've been successful in bringing math to, to, to kids at all kinds of levels. Um, but when you, but, but part of the problem I think in the United States is that teachers are not trained uniformly the same way. And different teachers are teaching math in different ways. Um, and some of them are not as successful as others. Um, I think if we look around and find the techniques that have proven to be successful and ap apply that much more uniformly across the different schools, we will see that math teachers will be much more successful with all levels of different types of students and we will we'll be able to bring and make math more understandable to these students. So if math were made understandable in the ways that you've indicated, do you think that it would be more appealing to girls and women than it is right now? Uh, I would think so. Mm -hmm. I think for one, I'm, I'm not saying that you should go around and say, oh, math, math is great for girls, math. I think a lot of the young ladies are um, ad, uh, adapt and they are perfectly capable of doing extremely well in math. Um, 
there has to be that attitude from the very beginning that it's perfectly normal to study math and that they can be good in math. That's number one. On one hand, I, I like the idea that we are creating more opportunities for young women to emphasize math. But sometimes that also um, can backfire because it, it's pointing to the women that, oh, there was a problem and women have a problem with math. And maybe uh, some women start doubting themselves at the first obstacle that they come across. So, it, and I don't really know how you solve that problem, but if we can all accept that, yes, women can do math, and, and from day one, we treat everyone the same, and say, okay, you, you do the math the same way as everybody else is doing it. Not, oh, you're a girl, we are going to try to help you now because you need extra help with the math. Mm -hmm. I, to, to me, that's somewhat defeat, uh, defeating the purpose because it's pointing to them that, oh, you may have a problem. And the fact is that they probably don't have a problem. And just present the material to them. And if you see that there is a problem, then um, reach out and help. I, I, that's my philosophy, at least. Then. No, that sounds great. <laughs> um, I I'd like to go back to Bulgaria for a minute. Um, so, uh, when you were growing up, it was the height of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. um, were you aware of anything, some effect of the Cold War? I mean, you were a child, and I don't know how aware of politics you were. Um, was that brought out? Uh, was there a lot of propaganda? I mean, or, or did you just kind of float through? Uh, oh. I think my first exposure to um, the dictatorial approach of communism was um, first grade. I was in the Armenian school, and the Armenian school was at the time right across the Armenian church. Um, that year, Easter Sunday, my parents went to Easter services, and the whole family went to Easter services. And of course, I went with my parents. Um, next morning, Easter was always a very big celebration at home. I still have such wonderful memories. Um, but next morning, the principal of the school, who, even though it was an Armenian school, the principal had to be Bulgarian. Um, so he called all the kids who had been to church the day before and gave us a, a long lecture on how religion was used to uh, exploit the masses and that it is against the communist beliefs and the fundamental beliefs of the party and, and so on and so forth. And I still remember that. And we were told that if we went to church again, we will be expelled from school. Oh. So we went home and told our parents, and uh, of course they said, well, I guess you guys are not going to church anymore. And not only that, but um, they were always afraid to speak in front of us. Um, the propaganda that we were given, we were, there was a very famous movie, I don't remember the name of the movie, and it, um, but I remember the story was about a young boy uh, whose parents were not pro-communist and they were plotting something against the regime and he was a hero because he uh, went and told the authorities that his parents were anti-communist and they were captured and so he was praised as a big hero. And of course, when we told our parents that movie, and I said, okay, mm -hmm, okay. And not only that, but um, because my, my father was never a member of any party or anything, and he was, he was uh, well, that was another story. And he, they had escaped from Turkey into Bulgaria. He, my grandfather passed away very, when my father was very young. So my father grew up an orphan and he had made himself, he, he had done extremely well under the pre-communist pre regime. Uh, and when the communists came, they confiscated everything he had. And he was particularly bitter because he said, I am the proletariat. You know, what is this nonsense? And, uh, and you know, he was very, very bitter because he had worked so hard to make himself, and yet they were taking everything away from him, everything he had worked for. Um, 
he was working extra hours in the evening. My mother started working as well, but uh, we were always checking through the peephole who was coming after 8 o'clock to visit. We were always paranoid that he, they will come and take him away again. Um, <clears throat> and and uh, what the, uh, what I, I remember hearing them talk about the irony that the real communists who fought, the partisans who fought in the mountains, they had lost all their privileges. The, the, the ruling class were those newcomers that had taken advantage of the situation. And um, um, the, the people who truly believed in the Leninism and, and the Marxism and this and the, they were the ones who were pushed to the side and all their dreams had disappeared because what was created was a new ruling class that was much more dictatorial and oppressive mm -hmm. than anything the country had seen under the Tsar's regime. And it was not naturally, people were, um, they really loved their king. Uh, that's at least what my parents, I, I never experienced that, so, but that's the way they thought. Um, so yes, I did experience that, and it wasn't just that. In, in junior high, um, this was just before going to high school, Elvis Presley had come out, was, had become very popular, and during one of the student gatherings, uh, one of the students had brought in a, a recording of Elvis Presley, and several of the kids danced the rock and roll. <laughs> They were gathered and sent to hard labor for two weeks because they dare dance capitalist Western decadent dances. Oh my goodness. And, and this went, was around what year? Um, this must have been about 1963, 62, 63, oh 64, my. somewhere around that time. Those kids came back, they were never the same because I don't know if you can imagine what labor camps were in Bulgaria like. They were excruciating. They, hard labor means really hard labor. And they were there how long for Two this? Two weeks. Two weeks, but that would be very oh, difficult. More than uh, enough. More than yeah. enough to kill their spirit. They were never the same. Wow. What did your parents do for a living? Um, my father was a jeweler watchmaker. And um, my mother had a degree in fashion design and was working as assistant designer in Bulgaria. Um, so she had artistic talent, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, she could draw, and actually, there are artists in, in my great uncle was an artist in, in Turkey, went to, to Romania after uh, the 1915 massacres in Turkey. And, um, that's when my par my grandparents went to Bulgaria. It was after, or during the massacres in 1915, because that's when they escaped from Turkey and went to Bulgaria. Um, my grandmother, my grandfather, and my father, who was nine months old at the time, literally crossed the border from Turkey through Greece into like, to, to Bulgaria. So, uh, did you have any brothers and sisters? I have a brother. Uh huh. Yes. And as you um, and your brother were raised, was there any message, either overt or covert, uh, from your parents or even from the neighbors or your family in general, uh, of what role that you should have or what the expectations oh. for you as a girl <laughs> <laughs> versus your brother? <laughs> well, of course, I was supposed to grow up to be. Um, how do I translate that word? It's a, a good housekeeper. You know, I was uh, helping around the house very early age with uh, cleaning and ironing. I learned how to iron my father's shirt when I was probably about seven or eight years old. And I was always helping my mother and I was always helping washing the dishes and setting the table and picking up the table and helping with the groceries. and. Uh, and yes, I was not supposed to be able to do certain things because I was a girl. Um, but surprisingly enough, I, I have to say my, my father and my brother were very funny because they would always say, oh yes, excuse me, you're a girl, you can't do that. But whenever they would be fixing something uh, mechanical or fixing around the house, they always called me to help. 
and I was always there helping with changing the oil of the car or fixing the carburetor or <laughs> hammering the nails in the wall and so so uh, somehow I was a girl who was not supposed to do that but when they needed help I was always there and I, they always asked me to come and help um, I think there was more of a there was a lot of teasing in our house in all directions and that was part of the teasing that went on between my brother and me and said, oh, you're a girl, you can't do that. And even, even now he says that, but and uh, he you says have my, my sister, the engineer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you've proved him wrong with well, this. Well, yeah, so I was always very quiet and said, I'll, I'll show you. <laughs> I'll show you who can and who cannot do what. <laughs> okay, so now moving fast forward, um, you were you're now at Columbia, right. and get uh, achieving a, a degree in civil engineering. Civil that engineering. Is, uh, okay. I did finish my degree in two years. Um, this was two years after the first three years at, at Queens College. Um, so at the time, I I don't know if they have that program. It was called the three two program, uh, where. Queens College had an agreement with several of the engineering schools in the New York City area mm -hmm. uh, where Queens College provided the pre-engineering training and then students going through the pre-engineering program could apply to Columbia City College of New York, NYU, I can't remember uh, which were some of the other colleges, but I did apply to all three. So um, when I got to Columbia, I had two more years to complete my bachelor's degree. Uh, and the agreement is such that when you complete your bachelor's degree uh, at one of these other institutions, Queens College honored the courses and gave you a Bachelor of Arts in Physics, in, this, in my case, or it could have been in math, but in, I chose physics because I took more physics classes. Um, so it, I did get two degrees at the end of the fifth year, which was a Bachelor of uh, Science in Civil Engineering from Columbia and the Bachelor of Arts in Physics from Queens College. So a lot of people look at my uh, CV and say, well, how come you got two degrees in the same year? And so, well, that so, was through a special arrangement. I say, it's just for me because I'm special. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you are. <laughs> no, it was it was the program that was available to me, and I took full advantage of it. Actually, I, um, I I do believe that the three years I spent at Queens were very special. Um, not only that, I did get good training uh, as a pre-engineer, but it gave me the opportunity to take a variety of classes in the humanities and um, that. I thought were phenomenal. I took a class in in art history that uh, that opened up a whole new um, horizon for me. Uh, we, it was uh, Renaissance art, and I absolutely loved the class. Um, I took a class in music. I, I did take I did take some piano lessons when I was very young, but. Uh, um, I didn't pursue it very hard because we didn't have a piano at home and it became very difficult for me to go to the teacher's house all the time and practice there. But, but I do gr grow up in a very musical family. My parents loved music and music was on all the time. My mother had a phenomenal operatic voice. Um, and she would sing and, and let her voice that you could hear her four blocks down the street. And, um, I went to the opera for the first time at the ripe age of 11 or 12, or I still remember it. We saw Il Trovatore. I remember my very first opera. And, and I loved opera as a result. And we went to a number of operators. And, um, so I grew up in a musical family, but I'd never had formal uh, classes in music and the history of music and uh, the story of the, of the various uh, composers and I took a class in music at, at Queens College and, 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 and went through the entire history from very early through Baroque through, uh, <clears throat> through the Renaissance period through the, uh, through the Romantic period modern and I, I loved it and I think it just was it was a tremendous part of my education uh, that I felt, and I took my extra English classes were in um, in poetry, and as a result, I, I still love poetry. Um, I can't say I like reading Macbeth. No, <laughs> it's well. bringing me it's bringing terrible memories to me. 
<laughs> bringing back horrible memories. So Did funny. you speak other languages besides English and Bulgarian? Well, I, I, at home we spoke Armenian. Oh, okay. Uh, so I did speak both Armenian and Bulgarian. I grew up with Armenian and Bulgarian. My, early on, my parents sent me to a French kindergarten. So I did learn French very young. Um, and then I took more French in college as one of the courses that I had, one of the foreign languages that I had to take. But Russian was mandatory starting fifth grade. So from fifth grade on, I studied Russian. I still can understand and I can say a few things, but I've forgotten. I, it's hard for me to speak. And when I went to Moscow, and quite a bit of it came back. But um, when I, we have a lot of Russians around now. I can hear them talking and I can understand what they're saying. Mm -hmm. So those were some of the languages that I grew up with and I was exposed to. And you grew up in Sof Sofia, yeah, right? Yes, Sofia, mm -hmm. Bulgaria, right. That's a capital. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, so now uh, you're ready for grad school because um, you uh, you were encouraged to go on to grad school or did uh, were you encouraged well, to just stop out and go to well, work? Well, um, I w didn't know exactly what I was going to do. I, I knew I was going to get my bachelor's and work as an engineer. In fact, I did do one. I did work one summer for an engineering company in New York City, um, Clark and Repuano, I don't think. I don't know if they still exist or not. They were a smaller company. Um, and then during my senior year in, in, at Columbia, actually during the second, first year at Columbia, I had met someone that I fell in love with, <laughs> or who fell in love with me as well, uh -huh. uh, who was a student at Columbia. He was fin finishing his PhD in mathematics and complex variables, and we started dating. Um, and I think he, th the fact that he was doing his PhD had an influence on me that I wanted to pursue a graduate degree, not necessarily a PhD, but probably a master's degree. And uh, during my senior year, I decided that I will stay at Columbia, and I would apply to Columbia to um, get a master's degree and the faculty were very encouraging and uh, uh, about uh, Professor Shinozuka and uh, Professor Mario Salvadori who was a very famous architect engineer in New York at the time. He's written number, numerous books that are still being used. Um, both of them had a strong influence on my decision to pursue a graduate degree. And, not on, and when I applied, I also received the Freudenthal Fellowship from Columbia uh, to do graduate studies. And it's a, a very competitive, very prestigious fellowship, uh, which I was really honored to receive that. But um, I got married in June. And your husband's name is? Garo Kirimidzian. Okay. Uh, he's, um, he had finished his PhD the year before and uh, was teaching at Stony Brook at the time. So we got married after I graduated. We had decided we were going to wait until I finished my bachelor's and then we, we had dated for two years and then we were engaged for about a year and a half or so and then got married in June after my graduation. So one weekend was graduation, two weekends later was our wedding or maybe a weekend later was our wedding, I can't remember. Um, well, I remember when our wedding was. I just don't remember what the, gradu the distance, the distance between graduation and <laughs> our wedding was one or two weeks. But whatever. Uh -huh. um, and we went on our honeymoon to Europe. And while we were in Europe, he received an offer from Stanford to come and teach as an assistant professor, and uh, for three years. And I said, hmm, so what do I do? I'd heard of the program uh, at Stanford because one of my classmates at Columbia had praised it so much and was applying to, to come to Stanford. And I said, hmm, Stanford, interestingly. So uh, while we were traveling in Europe, I applied to Stanford. And um, I was accepted, but I was, because I was applying so late, uh, I did not receive any funding which was going to create a little bit of a problem for a young couple coming to 
a new place and you know we started with zero in our bank accounts <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you yeah, know he came from an immigrant family incidentally he was born in the same city Sofia Bulgaria oh really they immigrated about the same time but we didn't know each other until five years after we had been in the United States and we met at a friend's party, at a mutual acquaintances party, I should say. But uh, we shared a lot of history and a lot of interest. And I think that's what, and love for math and science and um, love for music, and, you know, classical music in particular, and love for travel. Uh, we traveled for, for two and a half months on our honeymoon in Europe. I don't know if too many people have done that. Um, but at the time, it was affordable. Yes. <laughs> it was very affordable. You look back and say, how did we do that? <laughs> it was, uh, if I tell you how much it costs, you can't even buy an airline ticket today for that. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. <laughs> so but it, so um, we came to Stanford after, at the end of the summer. And he was teaching in a math department, and I started my graduate studies. Now, Stanford hadn't seen a woman in there in civil engineering before. <laughs> I was again the only woman, and I, I had some faculty who didn't quite understand what are women doing, and would come to class and say, what do women want? Now they want to be engineers? Now this was the time of the women's movement starting up. Yes, okay. that's right. That's right. Uh, the Barely. women's liberation movement was really starting up, and well, actually was peaking at that point. 1972, it was really peaking at that point. This was um, the um, SDS movement. It was the end of uh, the Vietnam War. It was a very tumultuous time. And I was at Columbia when all the students for Democratic Society SDS was uh, were rioting, and I, that was actually a, a big shock to me, having grown in, up in Bulgaria, uh, people rioting against the government, it's unheard of, how could they possibly, aren't they afraid they're going to be thrown in jail and sent to hard labor? <laughs> but it was, um, it's, it was a real eye-opener uh, as to what freedom meant. I, I got to appreciate what freedom really meant, is that people had the right to express their opinion. I mean, I still didn't dare do that, but I was appreciative that everybody else could say what they really felt and thought. And, um, so yes, I came to Stanford, and the first year, you know, again, I was going to do primarily a master's, and I wasn't sure whether I was going to stay for a PhD, but by the end of the master's year, I pretty much decided that I will stay on for the PhD, for, to do a PhD. And, um, I was very fortunate, I have to say, that Professor Shah, um, Harish Shah, Harish Shah, right, um, took me under his wing and said, "Okay, let's try it for the next year. Let's do some. Can be working on some projects." And he's uh, and it was extremely active, just as active as he's now. <laughs> he's, sometimes we call him the Energizer Bunny. <laughs> he has so much energy, even even until today. But he was even more energetic at the time. And it was during the second year after my my master's degree that uh, we had started working. I started working with him, and the earthquake in Managua, Nicaragua, had occurred. And there was no earthquake engineering program at the time. Um, so there was some, the more, it was a more traditional structural engineering program, and, but Haresh uh, uh, had gone to um, a look at the damage after the 1971 San Fernando earthquake the year before I ca came to Stanford, and then 1973 was the earthquake in Managua, Nicaragua. So he went to first by himself to Managua, and when he came back, he had a project to study the damage and to do hazard mapping. So I became part of the team that that studied and developed the seismic hazard map for Nicaragua. And I, I got very involved in the process and um, got very interested in the uh, earthquake problem and was probably halfway through 1973, actually in the, in the fall of 1973, 
in the fall or late fall of 73, it may have been 74, when we, oh yeah, actually it must have been 74 because we went, it was after our first version of the map was ready and there were three of us that went to Managua, Nicaragua to present our results. And then I had the opportunity I, to actually see the devastation from the earthquake. Um, and it really impressed on me what an earthquake can do to these to beautiful structures that we built and design. And, mm -hmm. and, um, um, and it really um, um, excited me to it, it create a, a purpose for me why, that why I would study earthquakes and the effect of earthquakes on buildings. It, I, I really could see the reason why we should be I should be working on that problem. It was a, a very serious problem where not only buildings were destroyed, but lives were lost and, and the economy was disrupted. And, um, and that's what I wanted to do, is study earthquakes. And, and it was also interesting um, that it was a very fresh um, area of study, meaning that the, there wasn't much known. And whenever you start working on a problem that not much is known about, there are a lot of opportunities to solve problems, uh, to make contributions. Uh, and I think that's was an, and, and it was also the atmosphere around us. And Haresh has a very um, infectious personality, as you yourself know. And he had us all excited about working on, on the problem. And, and he and Jim Gear also were working on establishing an earthquake engineering program at Stanford. And they were working with some of the leaders like John Bloom, who was known for his contributions at the time to earthquake engineering. And, and John being um, a graduate of the Stanford program with three degrees had a very a very soft spot for Stanford and wanted to establish an earthquake center at Stanford. Okay, at this point, why don't we take a quick break okay. and then we'll come back and hear more about your work with the Bloom Center okay. and how times changed through the 70s, 80s, and beyond in terms of women being in engineering. And then, of course, our very own earthquake, the uh, Loma Prieta, and okay. your role in that. <laughs> 